According to the latest statistics, mobile phones have become the main means by which cases of treason are revealed. Surprisingly, I ended up in this category myself. The blame for this lies with my partner, as she persistently persuaded me to purchase the latest iPhone 14 model. In the end, I gave in to her demands. Subsequently, she needed help transferring all her data to a new device. I showed her the ease of using the iCloud backup and restore feature, and she was delighted. To be honest, Sherry has always made sure that my happiness is a mirror image of her happiness. Overwhelmed with joy, at 1.30 a.m. in the morning I felt that my stamina was running out, my arms hurt from exertion, but I was blissfully satisfied. Perhaps this was the most difficult aspect. The happiness I felt was indescribable, and I could have sworn that she felt the same way. Her affectionate nature spoke volumes. She constantly showered me with praise and was ready for intimate moments. It was a source of great pride for me. If you've ever experienced the undivided attention of an attractive woman, you'll understand what I mean. That's why the shock hit me to the core. She never hid her phone from my sight, and we never bothered with passwords. We both trusted each other unwaveringly. She was right, and I was wrong. I had her previous phone, and I intended to restore it to its original settings. But I soon realized that we couldn't transfer her music to iTunes. Unfortunately, the music files are not included in the backup. In my opinion, this was quite annoying, as it defeats the purpose of creating a backup. Inadvertently, I pressed the wrong button on the home screen, resulting in her text messages. To my great surprise, it turned out that Sherry, my beloved wife and the future mother of our children, my life partner, confidant, lover, and best friend, was unfaithful to me. No, the first text message was quite brief, leaving me intrigued by the unusual name. But almost an hour later, when I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, I finally got the full information. Unfortunately, it was still the same typical situation, nothing new or surprising. She got into the second most common cause of infidelity, as follows from these damn statistics. Facebook has played a significant role, being cited as a contributing factor to divorce in more than 52% of cases. It's just a repetition of the same old story. Reunited after a while, one person arrives in the city with the simple intention of catching up. But as usual, unexpected events unfold. There is a playful exchange of opinions, a meal together, and even a moment of intimacy. It seems that this is not the first time, as evidenced by the circumstances. If the first meeting may not have caused any apprehension, then the last one seems to have made her feel remorse. She seems to doubt the wisdom of continuing their meetings, feeling guilty. She began to doubt her decision, but now it was too late. Isn't that a bit ironic, my dear wife? I firmly believe that my actions were justified. She betrayed our trust. I packed her things carefully and left them in boxes in the driveway for her return. I took the necessary steps to secure our home, changed the locks, managed our finances, and closed our credit cards. We both knew this routine well. After all, this has been my home since we got married three years ago. I no longer desired her presence. She had her own car and stuff. And yet, she complained stupidly, as if she had the right to do so. I apologize for my actions. I deeply regret what I did and understand the pain I caused. I ask your forgiveness and another opportunity to fix everything. But I know about statistics that say that once you change, you always change. What scared me the most was how skillfully she deceived me, because I had no suspicions. It has completely destroyed my trust and it is difficult for me to believe in her again. Even though others may talk, calling me guilty, claiming that she loves me and it was just a mistake, I can't just forget about it and take her back. It is unrealistic to expect that we will be able to move immediately to a passionate reconciliation. It seems like they want me to come to terms with being betrayed, but that's not something I can do. Any self-respecting man would not tolerate such nonsense absolutely will not tolerate it. It's amazing how everyone rallied around her. My parents, siblings, friends, 
Distant relatives, neighbors, colleagues, even my boss are all of them. Is that fair? She's betraying me, and for some reason I'm a villain. The only ones who didn't condemn me were her late parents, but that's only because they've been dead for almost 10 years. Sometimes I swear that I hear their night whispers, urging me to forgive and reconcile. Unbelievable. I was informed that she was completely devastated. I didn't want this to happen. He manipulated her. She loves you. The severity of depression is exorbitant. Consult a consultant for advice. It is much more difficult to understand this difficult situation. I understand. It's sweet like saccharin. There is not a single cruel bone in her body. I am always ready to help anyone who needs it. Transparent and honest. She openly expresses her emotions. You are familiar with all the common phrases. This is my sherry. I apologize. Feel free to criticize me. I really believe in loyalty. If you're single, that's one thing. Even if you are dating or engaged. But if you are married, having made such vows, I expected her to be faithful. Isn't that too much to ask? Apparently, that's what everyone else thought, including our lawyers and the judge who decided on the 50-50 split. It is unpleasant to think that, despite the fact that I brought all my possessions into the marriage and was the only earner, she did not contribute anything. We didn't have any children, and she didn't even have to run the household because a maid came to us every week. We ate mostly outside the house, not at home, but none of these factors seemed to matter. The concept of justice has no weight in the eyes of the law. I had to sell the house to give her half, and in the end, I suffered significant losses. I ended up paying her the staggering sum of $23,000 from various sources, including my savings, checking account, and even my hard-earned 401 k I was forced to buy her out of my own retirement plan, which I opened three years before our paths crossed. It was very bitter for me to swallow the pill when, with tears in her eyes, she declared that she was not involved in this decision, placing the blame on her brother and treacherous lawyers who wanted to take advantage of me. Her words might not be an exact coincidence, but they were damn close. To my surprise, they estimated my collection of weapons at more than $100,000, despite the fact that I spent no more than $10,000 to purchase it. It turned out that a couple of my grandfather's legally authorized automatic rifles were of considerable value. To provide her with money, I had to sell one of them, which was supposed to be inherited from my grandfather. It was her reward for betraying me by cheating. As a result, I remained loyal and offended. She continued to cheat for several more months, in particular in April and at the end of May. She got all the sympathy and financial support and I was left with debts. In my position, this is really unfortunate. As a result, the bitterness consumed me. Anger overwhelmed me. I was in an extreme rage directed at her, at our friends and at our family. Can anyone really blame me for choosing not to communicate with them? They all sided with her the liar, the greedy cheater. And I was unfairly punished, despite the fact that I loved, was loyal and worked hard, making reasonable investments. We devoted countless hours to meticulous work on the house, keeping track of expenses and diligently saving. I have an important message for all of you. Do you think you've got it all figured out? Let me share my experience. The most wonderful wife in the world can sometimes have a hidden side that seeks to bring chaos and despair into your life. Some individuals may take longer to reveal their true intentions, skillfully disguising them. Although I can't help but doubt my own mother's loyalty when she seemed to side with the cheater. It made me think about her, and also about Mrs. Evans, my third grade teacher, who was an absolute angel. I found myself alone, making excessive efforts, burdened with the obligation to pay alimony to my former partner, and in fact, starting all over again. Contrary to popular belief, I was unfairly labeled a villain for my uncompromising attitude, which allegedly brought her back into the arms of her ex due to a lack of alternatives. Nowhere to go? It is worth noting that she profited significantly from our relationship receiving more than $70,000 from me and another $1,200 a month for three years. 
couldn't she have found a job? That's exactly what I did. Unfortunately, she chose to rely on her ex for shelter, even though she had other options. He tried to maintain her usual lifestyle, although he really couldn't afford it. But she remained unsatisfied. She longed for my return, blaming me completely for the situation. Maybe in time I could forget about all this. Unfortunately, I was constantly attacked by other people who didn't want to leave me alone. I longed for a break. The incessant reminders urging her to give her another chance became unbearable. To top it all off, she participated in my sister's wedding as a bridesmaid, and I wasn't even included in the number of grooms. Even though I felt insulted, I didn't make a scene or refuse to participate. I handled it well. Of course, not everyone may like the large canvas portrait of Benedict Arnold, but the frame was amazing and quite expensive. It cost me more than $300. It was definitely a better gift than another run-of-the-mill toaster, don't you think? Even though I went alone, my scheming ex couldn't even match my level of sophistication. She had the audacity to take her new lover with her. But I decided not to make a scene and not to beat him up on merit. I am not one of those who resort to barbaric behavior. Moreover, when she asked, I even graciously danced with her. Can't you find the strength in your heart to forgive me, Rick? She begged. You look absolutely amazing today. I've always done that, haven't I? Do you see? I sincerely tried to be kind. I'm sorry. Please think again, my dear. You're the only man I've ever loved. I made a mistake. But my love for you has never waned. What a beautiful car you have. The new Lexus, right? I wish I could afford something like that. I still drive my old Honda. At least I'm close to paying her off. Please talk to me, dear. What is needed for this? We were meant to be together. Everyone recognizes this. You'll never regret it, I promise. I will make amends to you every day for the rest of my life. What a wonderful evening for a wedding. Have you ever thought about the cost of these exquisite ice jewelry? It's unfortunate that she ran away in tears, and I found myself playing the villain again. It's depressing. Despite all this, I tried my best to be kind. I refrained from expressing my true thoughts about her and did not utter a single swear word. And they still think I'm insensitive. Even my own mother scolds me for my actions. Please, Mom, leave it alone. I didn't do anything wrong. I treated her with respect. I just didn't want to give her false hope of reconciliation. But why not? She's really an incredible woman. After all, we all make mistakes. You are greatly exaggerating the situation. No one will ever love you as much as she does. And you're not fooling anyone. Deep down, you know you love her just as much. Please stop being so stubborn. Why don't you ever support me, Mom? She cheated on me and I didn't do anything wrong. I am your son, and you must be on my side in this matter. Darling, you know that we are all she has. She's like a family to us, almost like a daughter. We love her as much as we love you. Our only wish is for both of you to be happy as before. But it's important to remember that she's not your biological daughter. Three long years have passed, but her actions have not stopped. To my surprise, one day she appeared on my doorstep. Despite my doubts, I did not react sharply. Instead, I invited her inside and offered her a cup of coffee. When she took off her coat, I couldn't help but notice that she was wearing a seductive negligee. He was truly seductive. God, she still looked amazing. Please, Rick, I'm begging you. Give her one last chance. I beg your forgiveness, and I want you to take me back. I promise to be the most affectionate and faithful wife you can imagine. I dream of starting a family with you. I shook my head, unable to trust her anymore. You tricked me too easily. I didn't know about your true intentions, Sherry. You broke my heart, and then you took advantage of me during our divorce. You ran away with a disgusting man who helped ruin our marriage and my whole life. It wasn't what I wanted. All I wanted was you. You hired ruthless lawyers, signed the papers, and did everything you could to leave me with nothing. I had almost no possessions that I could call my own. You drive around in a brand new car decorated with luxurious accessories, dressed in exquisite underwear. You have everything, and I'm left with a broken heart. 
All I crave is the opportunity to make things right, my love. Life without you is an unbearable existence. You are my intended partner. Let's share an intimate moment, and I promise I will never leave you again. I will be faithful only to you. When she stopped talking, he proposed to me again. But I don't want that. I miss you, my baby. You won't be able to persuade me. When she rushed to me, her mascara stained my collar and tears soaked my shirt. It was undeniable this woman knew how to cry. Don't make me. She gasped between sobs, her voice trembling. Marry him, Sherry. No one is forcing you. You have the freedom to choose what you want. With desperation in her eyes, she begged, I want to be with you, Rick. In the end, she reluctantly left, leaving me to go through the same emotional turmoil again. Why can't I be rational? Don't I have a heart or a soul? Maybe she deserved a second chance. Although I was depressed, did I let my anger get out? Have I ever been tempted to harm anyone? Or cause destruction by setting fire to houses? Absolutely not. I just kept persevering, working hard and surviving. I didn't have many other opportunities. But they wouldn't let her rest. Despite the fact that she was already engaged and was preparing for the wedding with all her might, with the support of my mother and sisters, they persistently tried to burden me with feelings of guilt and pressure. It became a daily occurrence that seemed to never end. But it's not too late. All you have to do is say yes. She loves you. Show compassion. My mother always resorted to the I'm so disappointed card. I do not know what kind of person she married to tolerate such behavior. Personally, I would not tolerate it. It took a lot of persuasion and pleading on their part to convince me to attend her wedding. I resisted. But family can be exhausting. They kept insisting that it would help me forget. Reluctantly, I showed up, dressed appropriately, and even brought a gift to Toaster. I realized that sentimental gifts are not always well received. I've learned my lesson. When I went outside, I did not dare to face the crowd, who knew what harm they had done to me. But I did my duty and played my part. My mom confronted me, leaving me confused by her actions. She insists that I should reunite with Sherry, claiming that neither of us will find happiness without each other. But she doesn't understand that I can't find happiness with her. It's hard for me to understand why she can't grasp this fact. After all, she cheated on me, subjected me to public humiliation, openly confessed her infidelity, and moved in with this despicable man. Moreover, all the following years, she took money from me, lived with this man, and constantly reminded me of the pain, almost daily. I hate to hear that she wants to see you, Ricky, because she seems genuinely pleased to have you here. This is the only source of her happiness. Let her express herself, okay? I let her guide me on the right path and closed the door as we entered. When Sherry saw me, she was delighted and rushed into my arms. I just held out my hands to protect myself. Darling, she whispered showering kisses on my face, which was streaming with tears. I always knew that you would save me. I love you immensely. Save her? This woman organized everything herself. I don't know why, but something inside me suddenly snapped. I tried to be understanding, to be a kind-hearted person. I swear I've been giving it my all for three long years. I carefully unwrapped her and delicately lifted the layers of her wedding dress, exposing stockings and intimate lingerie. With a mixture of emotions, I unbuttoned my trousers and, in a few moments, I was involved in intimacy with her. At that moment I felt a surge of anger and decided to take revenge. It was the least I could do for the man who had wronged me. He stole it when it rightfully belonged to me, and now I will have it for the last fleeting moment. Rest assured, I will never repeat such actions when she is happily married. I don't want to be like these people. But for those precious few minutes, we were both free from obligations, enjoying the illusion of loneliness again. I may be trying to rationalize my actions, but it's important to note that she hasn't exchanged vows yet. Having intimate relations with her when she was still in her wedding attire, a moment before she was about to walk down the aisle, all this can brand me as an insensitive person. But I have never denied my shortcomings. God, this woman had an attractive figure. 
I decided to relax and indulge in the moment. The preparations did not take much time. When everything was ready, I carefully picked her up and placed her on the edge of the table, taking care to adjust her dress as much as possible. As I watched her, my thoughts whirled through my head. The betrayal that happened didn't bother me as much as the passionate intimacy we shared. Making love to Sherry has always been an unusual experience. The intensity of the passionate lovemaking intrigued me, and I secretly enjoyed it. Suddenly the door creaked open, and my mom looked inside catching us doing this. Oh, don't worry, I'll keep them at a distance. Take as much time as you need to sort things out. I let this lying and lustful woman kiss me and apologize. I hugged her passionately and took the time to figure out how to unbutton her dress from behind, trying to capture her charm in memory. It was a funny sight to do intimate things while she was directing my process. I carefully removed the top of the dress from her shoulders, exposing her ample breasts. I adore you, my love, she whispered softly. She thanked me gratefully, promising that I would never regret it. But deep down, I was already tormented by remorse, although not enough to prevent our meeting. It seemed that hubby would receive an unexpected surprise, and two at once. It's been quite a while. Three long years to be exact. I was walking towards my goal, getting closer and closer. I bent over her, hugging her tightly, moving with great speed as she gasped and whimpered. It was a moment filled with intense passion, and that's the only excuse I can offer. I certainly didn't want that, not in the least. There was no way I could honestly say those words. I let out a low moan in her ear and felt tears welling up in my eyes. Pulling away from her, I wiped myself on her garter and adjusted my trousers. I helped her adjust the top of her dress, calming myself down at the same time. But it doesn't seem to have changed much. Her hair was disheveled, her lipstick was smeared, and her mascara was running. She perfectly matched the appearance of the woman with whom intimacy had just occurred. One would assume that I would kiss her goodbye, wish her luck, and watch her walk down the aisle to meet her new husband, and their union would be marked by my lingering presence. If I had done that, maybe I could have claimed that I wasn't a really unkind person. I was pushed to the limit, but refrained from doing really terrible things. Sherry hugged me tightly, greedily showering my face with kisses. I knew you wouldn't let me marry him. I had a hunch. Deep down, I knew you had hidden feelings for me, she whispered seductively. Taking my hand, she led me out of the fitting room. Mom looked after me and smiled. Sherry turned in the hallway and pulled me with her as we left the church. Perhaps I could have intervened, but my thoughts were clouded. I was still furious because of her infidelity, because of the huge financial losses I had suffered, and because of the despicable man who seduced her. My anger spread to my entire family and our circle of friends. Climbing into a waiting limousine, she told the driver to go to my address. Sherry knelt down and unbuttoned my trousers, greedily giving me pleasure, as if her very existence depended on it. My mind wandered, reflecting on the sad events unfolding in the church. Of course, nothing good happened there. When the clock struck 10.20 a.m., I was busy with her again when the driver drove up and parked the car in front of our house. Sherry pulled away from me, straightened her dress, and quickly grabbed her small purse. Getting out of the car, I followed her example, straightening my trousers. She handed the driver an envelope, making it clear that our time together had come to an end. This is all for us. It would probably be better if you returned to the church. My fiancé may need your help, she offered. He looked at me in disbelief, and I just shrugged and followed her up the stairs. When I unlocked the door, she wasted no time getting out of her dress. Could you find me something to wear, dear? She asked, with a seductive grin. At that moment, I remembered the box of things that I didn't have time to return or throw away when she left. I couldn't understand why I hadn't taken any action about these things, because I didn't have the slightest desire to revisit the memories they held, or wallow in sadness about what I had lost. Not after what she put me through. 
There's no chance. A courageous person refrains from such nonsense. I took the box out from under the bed and handed it to her. She was naked and pulled me to her for a short kiss. Rick, I need your help. I made a stupid mistake. Really? Again? What have you done this time? I need to go to the bank. We've added each other's names to our accounts and I'm afraid he might be being unreasonable. I have to transfer our funds. Let me tell you more about it. I was in a state of shock, confusion, irritation, and desire. On Saturday, at 11 a.m., the banks remained open, which allowed us to continue the moment of lovemaking before heading to the car. Realizing that it would not be easy to delete each other's names from our joint accounts, my partner suggested a more convenient solution. To secure our assets, she offered to transfer money to my account. I was stunned to learn that she owns an impressive amount of more than $100,000. She explained that she had never used our shared finances, whether during the divorce process or the alimony I paid her. She firmly believed that the money belonged to both of us. She was looking forward to our reunion, but the nonsense of the cheater turned out to be wrong. During our lunch, she sat next to me, constantly sought physical contact, and even fed me from her plate. It was somewhat reminiscent of our past communication, as she was always affectionate. Although her level of affection may have increased, it was not a surprise to her. Eventually she went to the bathroom, and I thought about running away as soon as possible before the situation got even stranger. Unfortunately, I found myself longing for the continuation of this intense connection. After all, my heart can only direct blood flow to one organ at a time. Either my brain or my little Johnny is to blame for the fact that I felt inferior in the limo. Despite that, she still looked amazing. The intimate touches between my legs only increased my disappointment. After a few minutes, she finally returned and settled down next to me. I sent him a message apologizing, but deep down he knew that I would always choose you if the opportunity presented itself. I instructed him to do with my things as he saw fit whether it was a donation or getting rid of them completely. I have no desire to keep any of this, as it seems tainted by our connection with him. We are starting from scratch, and I promise that by choosing me, you will never regret your decision. She forcefully pulled me to her and planted a passionate kiss on my lips, inadvertently stealing a piece of my bacon cheeseburger. What an insidious thief. Surprisingly, this incident was a turning point for us, don't you see? He taught me how important pain is and how much I need you. I can never betray you again, not for the world. I promise to become the best wife in the world by devoting myself completely to you. In public I will be your angel and behind closed doors I will show my sensuality. She playfully took a bite of one of the french fries, resting her head on my shoulder. You look calm. Are you happy, my love? I hugged her, wrapping my arms around her shoulders and happily clung to her. We had to make up for three years of intimacy. She expressed her happiness with a squeal, carelessly leaving the money on the table, and eagerly pulled me along with her as we left. During the car ride home, she gave me pleasure. As soon as we got to the bedroom, she quickly took off her clothes, and I followed her example. Her smile met my gaze as she looked up at me. Realizing that the time was lost, she assured me that she was ready to fulfill any of my desires and fantasies. Without hesitation, I promised that I would not refuse her anything, and that everything she thought about would belong to her. Can we play role-playing games? Maybe call me names, invite my best friend? I'm ready for anything, dear, she offered playfully. She laughed and sat down on top of me with alacrity. She has always had an undeniable wild side, and it seems that she has only gotten better over time. It bothered me a little. When she slowed down her movements, swaying gently, I couldn't help but look puzzled. Why are you frowning, my love? You're amazing. Did someone teach you that? She pouted and confessed. Yes, I let him take me. I felt like I owed him a favor. She snuggled up to me, and I hugged her to me. She seemed to be in a state of confession. He loves me. Loves me as much as I love you. Completely, without any boundaries, without any reason. 
I can belittle him, embarrass him, mistreat him, and he'll still come crawling to me. Sometimes I felt guilty for taking advantage of his love, exploiting it in this way. But he understood that I didn't love him, that my heart belonged to you. He claimed that he would be patient and believed that in time I would love him. She kissed me gently. Never. I will never be able to love him. There is only room in my heart for one man, and that man is you. It has always been so, and it will always be so. You betrayed me because of your overwhelming love for me, I reminded her. She clung to me tightly, explaining that I was unable to comprehend the depth of his adoration. His longing look, desperate pleading, pleading look. He wanted me so much that in the end I decided to put him out of his misery. I slept with him, although I didn't get any pleasure from it. I hardly participated. But he, he was absorbed in the process of enjoyment. It's a heady feeling when someone wants you so badly. I cheated on you not once, but twice. I deeply regret my actions. You have nothing to do with it ever. You were everything I wanted for me. It was not caused by love for him, passion or other similar motives. It wasn't even about intimacy, which was never satisfying, especially to me. It was control over him. I manipulated him so that I could discard him later. I tried to be kind, but it was all over and he remained broken. I completely drained him, and as a result, I lost you." She bowed her head, tears streaming down her face. I hugged her, gently comforting her. When she pulled herself together, I couldn't help but notice how much she was sobbing, causing her body to convulse. It was a shock that seemed to affect me as well. It dawned on me how serious my actions were, and I vowed to find a way to redeem myself, no matter what the cost. For countless days and months, I have been in a state of emptiness. I sought advice from consultants who didn't understand much. They advised me to move on. But that was out of the question. I refused to let her go. At that moment she kissed me, sat down and made passionate love. This confirmed my belief that I was always right. They were wrong. I was sure that we would make up because our love for each other was too strong. We just needed some time apart. There was a smile on her lips. We both knew it would never happen again. I loved her deeply. Her body belonged to me whenever and however I wished. It was an incredible weekend. We didn't pay attention to the incessant ringing of phones and persistent knocks on the door. Our attention was focused exclusively on the bedroom. We even ate there. We made love. We took a shower and had fun together. In the limited time we had I tried to please her in various ways. By Sunday afternoon, the intensity of my desire had surpassed all thoughts of a full-fledged connection. I only craved physical intimacy with her, and that's exactly what happened. We spent the night cuddling, enjoying each other's bodies whenever I woke up from sleep. When Sunday night came, her body craved a break, and there were pleas for mercy in her strained voice. She told me about her life with him, and contrary to my own opinion, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for this unfortunate man. Loving someone with all my soul and being in a relationship with them but never really owning their heart was a deeply sad experience. He put his whole soul into their relationship, made sacrifices and even bought her a luxury car while he was content with a worn-out vehicle. Unfortunately, it all turned out to be in vain. On a gloomy Monday morning, I reluctantly pulled out of her arms, gathering the last of my strength for one last intimate meeting. It was obvious that she wasn't enjoying it, considering how physically uncomfortable she was, but she never turned me down. And she couldn't. While I was getting ready for work, taking a diligent shower and tidying myself up, she silently watched me from the bathroom. And that was the end of our conversation. When I was finishing up, she hugged me. It dawned on me that I need to solve a lot of problems. Since I was going to spend my honeymoon, I decided to take a vacation for the whole week. I have to talk to my mom and the rest of the family to explain the situation. It looks like I have to have a last meeting with him to clarify everything, although it won't be easy. She sighed. Could you give me a ride to his house? I need to pick up the car. No problem, I assured her receiving another affectionate kiss from her. 
I was so stunned that I didn't feel any physical reaction. Fortunately, it was for the best. Since it was going to be a long time, I dropped her off and pretended to be sick. After that, I quickly went to the bank and transferred all the money to a new account. Back at the house, I carefully packed her things, including her wedding dress. I changed the bed linen and aired the room, deciding to erase all memories of the incredible weekend we spent together. Realizing that I had made a terrible mistake, I securely locked the apartment and hid in a safer place. Let's be honest, I messed up everything. There was no way I could get her back. It was just impossible. I let the blinding emptiness consume me. I had a little fun, but that was the end of it. I must admit, I took the money. I thought it was fair and legal. After careful consideration, I determined that I really owed her. The house, the gun collection, and the 401k belonged to me by right. None of it belonged to her. It was a mistake to pay her alimony for infidelity. I wanted to be fair, so I prepared a check for almost $13,000 and sent it to her mother, along with a detailed explanation of why it was all she deserved. On the second day, I decided to contact my boss and have a deep conversation on the phone. To my surprise, he showed more understanding and compassion than I expected. Although he made the decision to let me go, he assured me that if I regained my composure and determination, we could resume our professional relationship. I expressed my gratitude to him for this opportunity. Subsequently, my phone remained inactive for three days. In the end, I contacted the service provider to temporarily suspend the service as I was planning to go abroad. To my pleasant surprise, they were very kind and informed me that they could freeze the contract, which would allow me to resume service whenever I wish. But at the same time, I had to contact them within six months. If I don't take action, I'll be trapped in a contract. When I arrived at Hedonism 2 in Jamaica, I was overcome by a feeling of relaxation. After my divorce from Sherry, I regret to admit that I didn't have another woman before our weekend together. But during my time in Hedonism, I discovered an abundance of friendly women. Many of them were married and older, and they were open to sharing experiences. As a young man in good physical shape and with a positive attitude, there were plenty of opportunities for intimate meetings. Of course, I took advantage of them. I discovered something that had been bothering me for a long time. It was a pretty sad realization. No one compares to Sherry, especially when it comes to being with me. But despite this, everything was going well. More precisely, not just good, but wonderful. It was a relaxing and enjoyable time filled with moments that I can't even describe. By the second week, my sanity had returned enough that I was able to call home. Unfortunately, the conversation didn't last long, and I hung up after 10 seconds to avoid the inevitable screams. Two days later, I made two more attempts, and fortunately this time they were somewhat reasonable. They asked, What have you done? I desperately needed a vacation and I took it. The stress became overwhelming and it was all too hard. Everyone kept pushing and pushing and eventually they took me too far, especially Sherry. Couldn't you at least tell her you were leaving? We would understand. Moreover, you didn't even leave her the key to the house. Of course, why? It's not her house anymore. It stopped being her home three years ago when she betrayed me, drained my finances and moved in with the man she cheated on me with. And yet somehow you managed to reconcile? Mom couldn't help but complain. I had an intimate relationship with her mother. Everything was consensual, and we both enjoyed it. But it was just a chance meeting and nothing more. She mentioned that you took her back. But it was an assumption on her part. Although I did not agree to a reconciliation, I did not want to spoil a pleasant weekend. It is important to repeat that I have no intention of getting back together with her. I've already made that clear to her many times. Now she finds herself in a difficult situation because her actions led to her fiancé ending their relationship. He even threw her things outside your house. I wonder where she'll find a place to live, considering she has $13,000 at her disposal. She has the opportunity to rent a house, 
find a job and perform the same duties as everyone else in the world. But it surprises me how you managed to take her money, which rightfully belonged to me. She and her lawyers illegally obtained them from me. Although she returned the money, I decided not to dispute it. In three years, the only fair action she has taken is to return what was owed to her. I gave her what she deserved, and I think I did more than fair. I didn't expect anything like this from you, because you managed to steal more than $90,000 from her. You ruined her wedding, took advantage of her, and dumped her. How could you commit such a reprehensible act? I suppose this coincides with what everyone has been talking about for the last three years. I must admit I haven't been behaving in the best way lately. Constant statements about me being an unpleasant person began to seep into my personality. Just as I was thinking about it, a knock on the door interrupted my thoughts. Wait mom, I'm sure it's Dave outside the door, I replied quickly. Tonight I plan to help Dave with a rather unconventional case involving his wife and sister which they call Hermetic. If you're wondering what that means, just ask my sister. She'll be happy to explain it to you. And now, as for Sherry, tell her that I had a great time and will definitely see her again. With these words I ended the conversation, full of anticipation for the upcoming evening. It's no secret that I have earned a reputation as a bore. But despite this, I managed to recover at work after a month of absence. I'm not worried about legal threats anymore. By adopting a more self-centered attitude towards myself, it became much easier for me to deal with it. Take Sherry, for example. I got rid of any negative emotions towards her. If I want her to be around, I invite her to my place for a short time. If she refuses my requests, I just pull away from her. Despite this, she continues to put up with it because she loves me and hopes that I will eventually change my behavior. But this is not happening. Despite this, I will have an intimate life with her because she is exceptional in bed. In addition, I study relationships with other people and have achieved some success. The future remains uncertain. Maybe one day I'll meet someone who will match Sherry's qualities. And I don't just mean the bedroom, but I'm not holding my breath because it seems that all women have a hidden side that can easily show up. How else can you explain the betrayal of a spouse through infidelity? Fortunately, family gatherings have become much more relaxed and less stressful, mainly because Sherry is usually present at them. Sometimes she even accompanies me to these events, and more often than not, she returns home with me. I must admit that after a few drinks, the acute desire for intimacy with her becomes undeniable. I think she's aware of that too. Every evening I was intoxicated, while she constantly supplied me with alcoholic beverages and enjoyed it. I understand that some may consider me a weakling for allowing her to keep some things in the closet, accompanying me on vacation and extending her visits. But I assure you that storing Diet Pepsi in the refrigerator is not the result of any obligations or obligations towards it. I am not married to her and therefore have no such obligations. So what if I like her? Nothing special. I just like spending time with her and enjoying the physical intimacy we share. This is something that I, as a man, really appreciate. Rest assured, I still maintain my independence and masculinity. So what if I like being intimate with her? As for the rumors about her pregnancy, accidents happen. It's not my responsibility. Okay, I assured her that if she could prove that the child was mine, then he would always live with me and I would take care of him. I must admit, I have no doubt about it. This woman is completely fascinated by me, and although I don't think she will betray me again, there are no guarantees. She has her own room, although I can't remember the last time she stayed there. But it's official. She has her own room. I have mine. If I decide to move on, I will ensure the well-being of both her and our child. But I want to emphasize that I am a person who values my freedom. I want to make it clear to her and everyone else that no one will limit me anymore. I refuse to be bullied like that again. I am an independent person, and I have completely moved on to a new level. Although my job required late nights, weekends, and periodic business trips, Stacy never worried about it. She worked for the first few years of our marriage, but after the birth of our son Jason, 
she decided to stay at home. We have a lovely house located in a pleasant area with excellent schools and friendly neighbors. Apart from my work schedule, everything seemed perfect at the time. I was lucky to have a wonderful wife, a flourishing family, and a job that I really enjoyed, and that provided for all of us. Difficulties arose with the arrival of our second child. It all started with the problems we faced trying to conceive our firstborn, Jason. The doctor informed me about the low sperm level, but assured us that we still have a chance to increase our family, albeit with additional efforts. Fortunately, my wife and I had a vibrant and satisfying intimate life, so the prospect of putting in extra effort didn't bother me. Unexpectedly, but happily, within three years of Jason's birth, Michelle appeared in our lives, which was a delightful surprise. After the birth of the child, we decided not to expand our family. Stacy firmly believed that taking care of a child was already demanding and all-encompassing. Over the years, we have faced typical problems and disagreements that any couple can face. But we have always been able to have open conversations and find solutions together. Subsequently, Stacy began to have health problems typical for women, and she sought help from a specialist. Fortunately, it turned out to be a minor problem, as she described it herself. Despite this, at that time we had to refrain from intimacy. Despite my repeated inquiries, she never revealed the exact nature of her problem, assuring me that there was no reason to worry. Looking back, I should have been more skeptical. But I continue to devote a lot of time to my work, and it seems to be paying off. Every three, four years I get a promotion. If this trend continues, then in a year or two I will most likely take up the post of Director of Production, which will give me the opportunity to reduce my working hours and devote more time to my family. In less than a year, our son will graduate from college, and Michelle is about to start her college career. We both have a natural talent for sports and I can't help but brag about it. Jason, my son, plays for his school's baseball team, and Michelle enjoys soccer, although she also plays softball. Academically, they are doing well, and their popularity among peers is undeniable. Each of them has an extensive circle of friends. Jason has gone through several romantic relationships, and Michelle is just starting to get to know the dating world. Oh, how I pray for divine intervention. Stacy made subtle hints that she would like to return to work now that Jason is going to college and Michelle is old enough to be independent. I couldn't deny that my wife had good reasons, so I agreed that it would be acceptable as long as her work didn't disrupt our family way of life. Eventually, she found a job as a salesman at a well-known department store located in the mall. There was a discount for employees attached to this job, which was a nice bonus. It's been a few months since she started working, and one day something unexpected happened. My plans for a long meeting with the supplier were suddenly cancelled, and I had a free day. Since my office is conveniently located next to the mall where my wife works, I took the opportunity to surprise her during a long lunch break. Knowing that she works in the jewelry department, I eagerly headed to her workplace. Arriving at the place, I eagerly looked around the neighborhood, hoping for her presence and help in choosing a thoughtful gift. To my disappointment, she was nowhere to be found. In search of help, I approached the young woman sitting at the counter and asked if Stacy was available. Unfortunately, she replied with a categorical, no. Sam, she's not coming until tomorrow, she said cheerfully, but I really need to start booking a hotel and all that. Can you ask her when she's free? He took out his cell phone from his pocket. No problem. I'll call her right now. She's still at home and shouldn't be at work until 8 in the morning. While he was on the phone, I listened to his version of the conversation, and then he finished it. She said she would fax her schedule for the month this morning. How do you like it? He smiled. Great. Just what I needed. Thanks, Sam. Please convey my gratitude to your wonderful wife as well. After about an hour, I got my wife's work schedule and found that she only works 10, 12 hours a week. This caused confusion, since she had previously said that she worked from 18 to 25 hours a week. It made me wonder why she would lie about her working hours. 
A cold shiver ran down my spine at the thought of possible causes. But at that moment, I couldn't focus on my wife, because I had important meetings ahead of me. It was difficult for me to focus on work all day. More than once I found myself getting lost in thought, trying to figure out what my wife might be involved in. As soon as the last meeting of the day ended, I retired to my office, closing the door behind me. Intrigued by what my wife does outside of work, I immersed myself in a thorough study of her schedule and even created an extensive spreadsheet, which I then uploaded to my iPhone. Deciding to find out her whereabouts, I went online in search of a way to track her movements unnoticed. I soon compiled a list of tools suitable for this purpose, as well as several additional useful things. Preferring to remain confidential, I decided to purchase a prepaid debit card for cash to avoid any trace on our credit cards or bank statements upon returning home. The next day, I placed an order for all the necessary items and arranged for their delivery to the office. Since their delivery would take several days, I had to develop a plan and prepare for the worst-case scenario. I sat down at my computer and made a list of possible explanations for why my wife had dishonestly told me about her work schedule. In the first place in my mind was the possibility of infidelity. If that were really the case, our marriage would be in serious jeopardy. But I couldn't accept the thought that she might betray me. Our marriage has always seemed solid, at least that's what I thought. Over time our intimate activity decreased, but we managed to make love too, three times a week. Of course it has become somewhat monotonous and predictable, but does this justify her infidelity? The following week, the items I bought were delivered to my workplace, ready for use. Among them was a tracking device for her car compatible with an iPhone or iPad and allowing me to track her location. In addition, I received voice-controlled voice recorders and several spy cameras that can be discreetly placed in our bedroom. And finally, my order included a high-quality digital camera with an impressive zoom. As I looked at all these things, a wave of nausea swept over me, signaling the grim reality that our marriage had become. Gnawing insecurity gripped me, making me think about the unthinkable spying on my wife to reveal possible infidelity. Desperately hoping that my suspicions were groundless, I couldn't ignore the overwhelming doubts that forced me to seek the truth, no matter what it took. The next morning, I got up earlier than usual, driven by anxiety and determination. Carefully, unnoticeably, I installed a voice recorder hidden in a tracking device secretly installed in my wife's car. Having completed this alarming task, I reluctantly went to work, but not before I studied her work schedule to find out when she would be absent from our house. To my surprise, there was not a single day of her work today. Despite this discovery, an insatiable curiosity gnawed at me, prompting me to dial her number and casually ask about her plans for the day. I took out my work phone and pressed the speed dial button. Hello, dear, I greeted. I just got to work, but I forgot to ask if you're working today. She hesitated before answering. Oh yes, I'm working, but I'll be home before you. As usual, it was just another lie. Okay, I just wanted to check it out. Have a nice day at work, I love you. I managed to say, although it was difficult for me. Knowing about the tracking device in her car, I planned to see where she would actually go. As soon as I get home... I'll set up spy cameras and dictaphones to find out if she brought the man who would be the height of betrayal into our bed. At this thought, I felt an unprecedented surge of anger. Her betrayal of me and our children demanded a reckoning. In the morning, I diligently watched my iPad, waiting for her to leave the house. Finally, around 10 a.m., I noticed her movements. Taking advantage of the moment, I decided that it was time to strategically place the remaining items correctly. After informing my administrative assistant that I needed to return home for a few hours, I assured him that I would be back after lunch. Quickly and discreetly, I placed the devices in our bedroom, ensuring optimal visibility and minimizing the risk of detection. After making sure everything was in order and checked, I decided to find Stacy. When I looked at my iPod, I found that she was at the mall. 
it was quite plausible that she had to go to work today. Without hesitation, I decided to surprise her again, and drove to the mall parking lot. Eventually, I noticed her car parked in the back, far from her workplace. It seemed unusual to me. Taking out a newly purchased digital camera, I couldn't resist and took some pictures. Finding a parking spot nearby, I headed straight to the jewelry department. Upon arriving at the place, I noticed the same young woman who had previously helped me. Hello, I would like to know if Stacy is working today, I asked. Unfortunately, sir, she quit last week, the source replied. She mentioned that it affected her family life. Is there anything else I can help you with? He added with a smile. Politely refusing, I held a simmering anger. The feeling of betrayal was indescribable. If Stacy had been at arm's length, my impulse to slap her would have been irresistible. How easily she deceived me. Now the disturbing thought crept into my head that this deception was continuing. I couldn't help but wonder how long and with whom. Determination was born in me, and I vowed to get to the truth and make sure that both Stacy and her lover would be punished. I made a firm decision to refrain from returning to work. Having chosen a strategically important parking spot, I positioned myself so that I could clearly see her car and at the same time not attract her attention. With the help of the camera's zoom function, I could discreetly observe her from a safe distance and, if necessary, document the events that would unfold after her return. As the clock approached two o'clock in the afternoon, a car parked next to her car, which attracted my attention. I watched carefully as she got out of the passenger seat, bent down to exchange a few words, and smiled. Such a seemingly casual gesture caused a surge of anger in me. I quickly took a lot of pictures of her at that moment. When she got out of the car, I couldn't see the driver's face, but I noticed the dealer plates on the car. Knowing that there are only a few car dealerships nearby, I decided that it would not be difficult to track this car. Presumably she left on her way home. While I was sitting and thinking about what I had just witnessed, an idea struck me. I decided to drive past several dealerships hoping to spot the car. After leaving the parking lot, I headed to the car dealerships and soon came across signs and flags with tempting offers and new models. Instead of looking for a new car, I decided to find the man my wife was dating. Despite visiting several car dealerships, I was unable to locate the car I had noticed earlier. In order not to alert the person who betrayed me, I did not dare to leave the car. But it occurred to me that I hadn't seen any concrete evidence of their affair. It became necessary to catch them in the act, but I didn't know what to do. However, I had to postpone this issue for a while because I had a three-day business trip with a client, and I needed to keep my concentration. I returned home at the usual time and found that everything seemed to be in order. It reminded me of the trip, prompting me to come up with another lie. I'm sorry, dear, but they decided to extend our stay here for a whole week. I have to be back by Saturday afternoon. I hope it won't inconvenience you, I said, trying to stay calm. No, it should be fine, she replied with a smile. But deep down, I suspected that she was planning to spend time with her lover. Determined to catch them in the act and put an end to this deception, I got into bed and pretended to be asleep while my thoughts raced in search of a solution. The next morning, I went to work. I pushed this issue to the background and devoted all my attention to work, allowing the week to fly by unnoticed. Sunday afternoon was approaching, the departure time was approaching. My son kindly offered to take me from the airport, but I felt some anxiety in his silence during the trip. Curiosity got the better of me and I asked him, Hello big guy, you're unusually quiet, is something bothering you? Clearing his throat, he finally plucked up the courage and said, Dad, I do not know how to tell you this, but I think you deserve to know. Mom is involved in... Well, she's involved in something. Trying to find the right words, I helped him. She's having an affair, isn't she? I'm aware of that. Is that what you wanted to tell me? He looked at me, a mixture of surprise and sadness reflected in his eyes. Are you considering a divorce? At the moment, I'm not sure. 
How did you know she had another one? A few weeks ago, my baseball practice was canceled due to rain, which allowed me to return home a few hours earlier than usual. While the rain was pouring steadily, I entered the house unnoticed, but their voices reached my ears. Curiosity made me head to your bedroom, where I saw the two of them doing intimate things. The shock held me down, I didn't know what to do next, and so I tried to hide with a friend. I returned home a few hours later, still trying to cope with the overwhelming revelation. I noticed tears welling up in his eyes when he confessed. God, at that moment I wanted to hurt her. I asked, does Michelle know about this? He shook his head and replied, no, I doubt it very much, and I certainly won't tell her. You know her explosive nature. I expressed relief and said, good, because I am determined to save our marriage and save our family. He called me. Just try to behave normally when surrounded by your mother and sister. And if you ever need someone to talk to, feel free to call me. I nodded, assuring him, okay. When I got to the airport, I hugged my son tightly, urging him to hold on. He nodded and promised, I will, and I'll take care of Michelle. After that, I met with my colleagues and we went through the check-in procedure before boarding the flight. Our trip turned out to be incredibly successful, as we managed to close a major deal with a new client. It took several days of meetings and negotiations, but both sides were satisfied with the result. On the last day, while we were enjoying a late lunch to celebrate our achievement, Jason suddenly called me urgently. He was furious and asked if I needed to come home urgently. His panicked voice made me worried and I anxiously asked what happened. It turned out that it was about Michelle. When she found out about her mother's infidelity, the situation became incredibly unpleasant. You should return home immediately as she physically injured. What exactly happened? He refused to divulge details but said I needed to get back as soon as possible. I took my leave, citing family circumstances, and quickly left the hotel. When I got to the airport, I hurriedly boarded the nearest available flight home. Despite the fact that the journey took only two hours, the minutes dragged on endlessly. As soon as I set foot on the ground, Jason was already there, waiting for my arrival. I want to know what happened. How did Michelle find out about your mother's infidelity? She decided to figure out the situation on her own, just like me. After her softball practice was canceled, she returned home early and found them in bed together, just like me. But the only difference was that she decided to confront him with a baseball bat. I stared dumbfounded at Jason, who had a triumphant smile on his face. It became obvious that his wife's lover would experience severe physical pain and would most likely face irreversible consequences related to his intimate life. Perplexed, I asked, what did she do? Michelle's explanation, which she gave before she was detained by the police, shed light on her actions. When they were making passionate love, their intimate moment was abruptly interrupted when she unexpectedly walked in on them. Shock showed on her face, but her anger was palpable. Flushed with rage, she retreated to her cabin and quickly took out a softball bat to vent her anger on the intruder. With each swing, she mercilessly beat the man, trying to inflict as much damage as possible. Satisfied with the punishment, she quickly dialed the number of the rescue service, inventing a story about the criminal's attack on her mother. Urgently demanding the presence of law enforcement agencies and doctors, she assured that help would arrive soon. Meanwhile, I had just returned home, and the anguished cries of the unhappy soul upstairs reached my ears. The police arrived at the scene and began a thorough investigation, interviewing my mother, Michelle, and everyone involved. This man named Kevin was involved in a situation in which Michelle was firmly convinced that since it was not her father who entered into a relationship with her mother, there must have been a use of force. Therefore, she took the necessary actions, in her opinion, to prevent further harm. In response, Jason couldn't help but smile, even though the gravity of the situation demanded seriousness. To my surprise, I laughed myself. When we got home, I found Stacy sitting on the couch looking extremely upset. 
I went up to her and took her in my arms, assuring her that everything would be fine. I comforted her by acknowledging that she had been through a huge trauma. I am sure that with proper support, she will eventually recover from this ordeal. To deflect suspicion that I know the truth, I deliberately emphasized the topic of the attack. She trembled, overcome with fear. Subsequently, tears flowed down her face. I looked at Jason and asked where Michelle was. Is Michelle still at the police station? I asked. Not knowing what to do next, I got up, took out my phone and dialed the number of our family lawyer. I told him what had happened and asked for advice. I also asked if he could recommend an experienced lawyer for our situation. He assured me that their firm had a suitable lawyer and arranged to meet me at the police station within the next hour. Feeling the need for privacy, I pulled Jason aside to talk to him discreetly, away from Stacy's ears. I prefer your mother not to know that we know about her affair. From our point of view, Michelle was chasing a criminal. Is that clear? He chuckled. You should stay here to make her comfortable while I pick up Michelle and bring her home. I was talking to the officer on duty at the police station, patiently waiting for the lawyer. He eventually arrived, dressed in a professional suit and tie. Together we worked to secure Michelle's release. According to the information I received, Kevin intended to press assault charges against Michelle. When I inquired about my wife's decision to press assault charges against Kevin, I was informed that she had decided not to do so. This revelation put her in a difficult position. She was caught between a rock and a hard place. If she had refrained from pressing charges, she would have had to confess to treason, which could have led to legal consequences for Michelle. On the other hand, if she continues to press charges, Kevin will most likely reveal their affair, and Michelle will end up in jail anyway. At that moment, I was overcome with a mixture of pride and sadness for Michelle. I was proud that she had shielded her mother from the alleged attack, and at the same time I was deeply saddened by the unfortunate circumstances that led to her finding out about their affair in this way. It was at that moment that I realized the truth, and here it is, the end of our marriage. Several hours passed, but Michelle was finally released into my custody with a promise to appear in court in the coming days. I hugged my daughter tightly while she was crying. I'm sorry, Daddy, but I had to stop him, she sobbed. It's okay, baby. You did the right thing and I can't be proud of you, I said, now bursting into tears myself. Can we go home now? What is it? she asked. Of course, honey, of course, I replied. When we arrived home, Jason greeted Michelle with a warm hug when she walked through the door. How are you? What is it? He asked, noticing her sniffling. It's better now that I'm home, she snorted back. I searched the living room for your mother. Where is she? I asked. She went to lie down, he replied. Michelle muttered angrily in her voice. This corrupt woman, I will live with you dad when you get divorced. Jason and I exchanged glances, surprised by her comment. Darling, who said that I plan to divorce your mother? I asked. Michelle replied, Well, I just assumed that since she's been cheating on you for over a year, you'd want to get a divorce. Once again, Jason and I were stunned by her words. What? I overheard their conversation before I ran into him, Michelle continued. And let's just say he won't be enjoying intimate moments anytime soon, if at all. A smile appeared on her face, which made me burst out laughing. Before discussing the divorce, I have to talk to your mother first. Why don't you both go to bed? It's been a long and tiring day for all of us. When I went upstairs, I found Stacy lying face down on our bed, fast asleep. I grabbed my clothes and retired to the spare bedroom to sleep. It was getting late, and I didn't want to bother her to listen to her version of events. It wasn't easy for me to sleep, but in the end, it covered my head. The next morning, I woke up around 10 a.m., feeling just awful. I got out of bed and headed downstairs in search of a cup of coffee. As I approached the kitchen, I noticed Jason and Michelle talking at the table. When they saw me, they both stood up impatiently and hugged me. 
Jason looked at me intently and expressed concern when he noticed that I looked exhausted. I just nodded in agreement, admitting that I felt exhausted. My curiosity was aroused, and I asked where their mother was. To my disappointment, they shook their heads, indicating that she hadn't gotten up yet. Michelle intervened, her tone full of bitterness, wondering about the future and the possibility that she would end up behind bars. She even stated that she would rather go to prison than live with her. Trying to diffuse the tension, I gently reminded Michelle that her words were driven by emotion and that their mother really loves them both. Despite the damage she has done to our marriage, I will talk to her to find out if there is an opportunity to solve our problems, but I'm not particularly optimistic about the result. I didn't have any expectations. Suddenly, Stacy appeared in the doorway. Please, I'm begging you to give me the opportunity, she pleaded. I don't want to lose you or our family. Can't we talk? Can't we try to fix it? I looked at her, and the children stared at her with hostility. Stacy and I needed to talk in private, away from the presence of the children. So, I handed Jason a couple of $20 bills. Why don't you and Michelle go watch a movie? Let's have a pizza after that, I suggested. Both agreed with a nod. They said goodbye to me lovingly as they left, but their silence towards Stacy did not go unnoticed. Overwhelmed with guilt, Stacy sank into a chair, absorbed in her own thoughts. They despise me. My own children despise me. What did you expect? You betrayed them by getting involved with another man, and they found out the truth. So what do we do now? I understand that Kevin intends to sue Michelle. If that happens, I will make sure that this whole unfortunate situation becomes public. It's important that you talk to your lover. Also, if he refuses to cooperate, tell him that you will press assault charges against him. Do you understand? She nodded, tears streaming down her face. But what about our relationship? But what about our marriage? Next week I will go to a divorce lawyer. You can do the same. Our marriage, to tell the truth, broke up many years ago. I'm going to seek full custody of the children because, well, Michelle might hurt you while you're sleeping. Do you really want to live in fear of your own children? They adored me. She was crying. But their feelings changed dramatically after they found out the truth about you. Look, no matter how we approach this case, it's going to be dirty. I know I'm going to regret saying this, but it would be wise for you to consult with a lawyer and explore your next steps. I will try to be fair, but you have caused great pain to me and the children, and it is not so easy to forgive. Tears flowed down her face again. Darling, I don't want a divorce. I dream of rebuilding our family. Please help me achieve this. Why? Your betrayal is not limited to me. It spoils the very essence of our family. The children have no desire to communicate with you anymore. Stacy, your actions have caused significant damage, and I'm not sure I can save our marriage. Please advise me what steps need to be taken to save our family. I deeply regret the situation. Her tears intensified. To begin the recovery, it would be useful for both of us to meet with Kevin and convince him to withdraw the charges against Michelle. After that, we need to talk frankly about your motives and determine if our marriage can be saved. I can't make any promises at the moment. If you're willing to demonstrate transparency and honesty, maybe we'll have a glimmer of hope. When I entered the room, I couldn't help but notice that both of his legs were suspended in the air, bound by ropes. His knees were wrapped in bandages, and a cast was placed on his arm, presumably from an attempt to protect himself from Michelle's blows. A faint smile appeared on my face as I thought about surprising her with a car for her upcoming birthday, even though she's still two years away from being able to legally drive a car. Kevin, sensing our presence, looked stunned and detached. His eyes were glazed, which was most likely the result of the painkillers he had been given. I silently hoped that the effect of the drug would pass soon. Well, 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 if this is not an affectionate couple, he muttered, inviting us to come closer and look at the consequences of his meeting with Michelle. In a calm tone, as if intoxicated, she said, Please, Kevin, let's talk. 
There is no need to be hostile. Stacy's voice trembled as she spoke. Her nervousness was obvious. I wondered why she was so nervous. And then the truth was revealed. I remember telling you to terminate your pregnancy 14 years ago, but you decided to have another child, even if it wasn't mine. Kevin spat out. I turned to Stacy for clarification. What is he talking about? Are you saying that Michelle is not my child? She answered quickly. Don't pay attention to his senseless nonsense. It's just that the drugs are working. Don't pay attention to his words. At that moment, she visibly shuddered. Really? In that case, I think a DNA test will irrefutably confirm that she is my daughter. Maybe I should do it for Jason, too, to make sure he's a father. What were you thinking about? I was filled with such rage as I had never experienced before. Stacy ran out of the room in tears. I just froze in place. Then I looked back at Kevin and looked straight into his eyes. Great, you despicable man. That's what you're going to do. First, you will drop the accusations against Michelle. Secondly, I insist that you stay away from my family. As for Stacy, feel free to continue your illicit relationship, because it won't be long before she stops being my wife. Is everything clear? From now on, both of you can engage in any intimate relationship you wish. There were tears in his eyes. This despicable person made sure that I would never experience intimacy again. Yes, I'm going to give her a car for her upcoming birthday. Curiosity got the better of me and I asked, Is she your daughter? He nodded silently, unable to say a word. I continued, So you and my wife have been having an affair for the last 15 years? He confirmed it again with a nod. The blow to my ego was so strong that I found solace in her absence from the room, because if she had stayed, I'm afraid the anger inside me would have consumed her. I sank into a chair and stared aimlessly into space, wondering how I could have been so forgetful. It suddenly dawned on me. In the past, she had faced unresolved problems that she had never told me about. A disturbing thought appeared. I looked at Kevin, desperately searching for answers. Could her previous medical complication have been another aborted pregnancy? He confirmed my suspicions with a solemn nod. The weight of this revelation crushed me. Emotions overwhelmed me. I told her that if she doesn't have an abortion, I will inform you that neither Michelle nor the last child belongs to you. Overwhelmed with grief, I buried my face in my hands, tears streaming down my cheeks. I was thinking to myself, upset and angry about Stacy's actions. Gathering my thoughts, I left Kevin's room. When I entered the reception area, I noticed that Stacy was sitting there, not taking her eyes off the window. When she noticed me, she got up and joined me as we walked to her car. There was silence in the car until Stacy finally broke it. She admitted that I must despise her, but insisted that everything was not as it seemed. Before she could continue, I interrupted her, warning her that if she claimed it was just an intimate encounter, she would be in the same position as Kevin. When did this novel start? And when were you planning to tell me about the abortion? When were you planning to tell me that Michelle wasn't my daughter? Her tears resumed, but this time I remained indifferent. So, let's determine how events will develop. If you do not do all of the following, prepare for catastrophic consequences that will engulf you entirely. Is that clear? She nodded back. First of all, our marriage is over, and you're leaving home tonight. You are strictly forbidden to ever come back to this house. Secondly, I will get full custody of the children. You may have visitation rights, but only if the children give their consent. If they choose never to see you again, so be it. Finally, I want to emphasize that if you ever discuss with Michelle the fact that I am not her biological father, it will greatly bother me. I urge you to refrain from disclosing this information to anyone, including your family, friends, and work colleagues. It is not my intention to cause any harm, but I must emphasize that if this secret is revealed, it will undoubtedly affect many aspects of your life. Besides, I know that you've made certain decisions to hide this truth, 
like leaving your job to spend more time with Kevin. As painful as it is to face this, I think it's important for us to be honest with ourselves. Stacy, I think it's better for both of us if we keep our distance in the future, especially with regard to my children. I hope you understand the seriousness of my words and respect my wishes. By the way she looked in my direction, as tears flowed down her face, it was clear that she was aware of the gravity of the situation. They are also my children, but they are not the same anymore, she replied. If they agree, you can visit them, although it's unlikely. But as soon as we get home, I need you to pack your things and leave. Tears streamed down her face as she spoke. Stunned, she asked, where should I go? I replied, contact your parents, find a friend, ask if Kevin will let you stay with him, or even think about going to the park with a tent. To be honest, I don't care. You can go to hell. I don't care. Silent and tense, we returned to my house. After parking the car, we sat in the driveway without saying a word for several minutes. Finally, I couldn't stand the silence anymore. Why, Stacy? I asked, desperately trying to find an answer. Have our efforts failed? The family we built, the cozy house, was physical intimacy the only problem? It didn't make any difference to me. At first, he succeeded in this plan, but soon after Michelle was born, he resorted to blackmail. I genuinely care about you. Can't we try to save our relationship? I asked. After all these years, Stacy, you betrayed me for 15 years, and now you expect us to make up? Pack your things and leave my house immediately. Enraged, I jumped out of the car and burst into the house. A few minutes later, she entered the house and began to pack her things. An hour had passed when she finished packing her suitcases and filled several cardboard boxes with her belongings. She went out the front door and started loading the car. Soon, she entered the house again. I will have to go back to pick up the remaining things, she said. I'm going to live with my parents. Can I call you to arrange a pickup time? I nodded silently. You've ruined something good, Stacy. I hope you realize this. I expressed my disappointment. She just looked at me and left. About two hours later, the children returned and looked around the neighborhood. Jason asked, Where's mom? I replied, She doesn't live here anymore. I informed her that I would get custody of both of you and she would be able to visit you if you agreed to see her. I'm sorry, but our marriage could not be restored. Michelle came over and hugged me. Thank you, Dad. We love you. Are you okay? Jason asked. No, but with your support, I'll be fine, I replied, hugging them tightly. Over time, eight years later, Michelle, Jason, and I were able to overcome the damage that Stacy had done to our family. The children completely distanced themselves from her, giving her the opportunity to come for an hour or two on the weekend, if there were no games or other things planned. Unfortunately, it seemed like there was always something planned for this weekend. Despite my attempts to reconcile and establish communication, as soon as Jason turned 18, he bluntly stated that she was no longer his mother and told her to go to hell. Michelle followed suit, which devastated Stacy deeply. For the first time in a long time, I sincerely sympathized with her. After my conversation with Kevin, he decided to drop all assault charges against Michelle. I made it clear to him that if he continued the accusations, Stacy would sue him for assault. After being discharged from the hospital, Kevin now walks with a cane, and there are rumors that he is experiencing difficulties with intimate function, despite having tried Viagra and consulted with numerous specialists. It looks like he spent a significant amount of money on these consultations, but to no avail. At Michelle's insistence, we decided to do a DNA test, which showed that she was indeed my daughter. The moment we learned this truth, we hugged each other tightly, and tears of joy flowed from us. We were both greatly relieved. But now I'm haunted by the question, was the child that Stacy decided to abort also mine? This thought will stay with me for the rest of my days. For several years, Stacy lived with her parents and found a permanent job. She eventually decided to move out of state, and unfortunately, we lost touch with each other. 
Although she sends birthday and Christmas cards to the children, they always return them unopened. At the same time, Jason received a scholarship to play baseball and continued his studies at a prestigious university, and Michelle hit the road to become a college nurse. Both of them are doing well in their studies and have started dating. Jason is in a serious relationship now, but Michelle has expressed a desire to find a partner like me. Personally, I think she deserves someone better. It took me a few years before I felt ready to start dating again, but eventually I met a wonderful woman who I spend time with regularly. I'm not going to rush into a new marriage, as the pain from the previous marriage still hasn't subsided. But life is moving forward, and the pain is getting less and less every day. I am incredibly grateful to my children. They have become a source of comfort to me. Katie and I have been happily married for over three decades. Our journey began when we were both young, and now, at the ages of 59 and 55, we have built a wonderful life together. Over the years, we have raised three wonderful children who have already become adults. Like any other marriage, we faced both joys and problems, but we are distinguished by the constant support of each other. Katie holds a special place in my heart, despite the fact that her beliefs are different from my own. She surrounds herself with friends who advocate feminism, identity politics, and social justice concepts that I may not quite agree with. But I respect that everyone has their own point of view on these issues. In our conversations, Katie and I try to explore and appreciate each other's points of view. At first, I might not notice or attach much importance to the ideas that Katie was accepting or starting to accept. They all seemed meaningless to me. Katie held firm beliefs about the long-standing oppression of women, which sometimes scared me. Interestingly, she has not personally experienced any form of oppression or discrimination. Such conversations disturbed me, and I often tried to distract myself from the topic. I have seen such glib women on TV who loudly uttered irrational things and scolded others without giving any logical refutations. I was increasingly worried that Katie was being influenced by them. It all started with the fact that she began to express doubts about our marriage, claiming that the spark was missing in it. In an attempt to save our relationship, I suggested therapy as a means of solving our problems. But she insisted on going on vacation alone instead. After hesitating, I reluctantly agreed, but later found out that she decided to go with her friends, whom I considered harmful. When Katie returned from a week-long vacation, I was shocked by the amazing transformation she had undergone. Her hair was cut, which gave her a new, unfamiliar look. It seemed like this was a completely different person that I had never encountered before. When she arrived, there were no warm hugs, no signs of affection, and I felt uncomfortable and aloof in her presence. Katie began to devote more time to her friends and participate in protests some of which I did not support. In an attempt to allay my fears, I started a deep conversation with her, expressing my concern about the path she was following. I advised her to reconsider her decisions, but she ignored my advice and continued her activities. The situation took a turn for the worse when she was detained for participating in a protest that caused traffic disruptions. I had to pick Katie up from the police station, and we had a passionate conversation on the way home. She remained silent throughout the trip, which increased my concern for her well-being. Katie started working on social media, particularly TikTok, to spread her feminist beliefs. Gradually, she gathered a solid audience, which indicates her desire to create fascinating content. She devoted a lot of time and effort to her videos, carefully choosing outfits, and carefully creating content for a specific platform. It became obvious that social media participation takes up a significant part of her time and energy. One day, while watching videos, I came across one of them that left me deeply moved by its message. In the video, Katie began by saying, Good morning. Do you aspire to become an unhappy, pathetic old woman? None of us wants this fate for ourselves, but we have all seen those women who constantly look unhappy, constantly grumble and complain to their husbands. We all hope not to become one of them. 
It's curious how this happens, but Katie explained that it often starts with the difficulties associated with raising a family and working tirelessly at work. Over time, often at the age of 50, 60, we come to a sudden realization that we did not pay due attention to our individual existence. Our lives are intertwined exclusively with our family or spouse, as a result of which we feel empty and dissatisfied. Therefore, we need to take the initiative and identify our personal aspirations and pursuits. We must look for something that brings us true satisfaction and a sense of vitality. Even in a healthy marriage you can experience unhappiness. Divorce may not be a necessary solution, but cultivating one's own individuality is of paramount importance. Striving for a full life, we must understand what really nourishes us and gives us the feeling that we really lived. Time is fleeting, and in the face of the uncertainty of tomorrow, we should think about how we live now. Would we be content to continue on the same path if this was our last year? Probably not. So let's go on a journey to embrace every day, cherishing the joys of our marriage, and at the same time developing our individuality, different from the role of wife and mother. Women deserve to break out of stagnation and explore the vast opportunities that open up to us in this world. There is a huge amount of experience and opportunities in the world that are just waiting to be discovered and used. The path to self-realization and happiness does not necessarily end when the children leave. There are various ways in which we can find satisfaction. Therefore, I hope that this point of view will be useful. Hearing her words, I felt a subtle call for women to think about divorce. This thought alarmed me, and I decided to talk to her later in the evening. To my surprise, she informed me that she had already decided to leave and packed her things. Despite my attempts to dissuade her, she firmly stated that she longs for a life filled with freedom and happiness, and called boredom a driving force. She doesn't want to take on the responsibility of being a grandmother or my wife. Her desire is to live a carefree life and go beyond what seems like a prison to her. This news left me speechless, as if I had lost my wife to the toxic influence of people who corrupted her thoughts. Despite my sadness, I did not interfere with her decision, but simply expressed my longing for her and asked her to return as soon as she completed her research. She moved into a small apartment located in the heart of the city. I informed my children about the situation with their mother, believing that she was just going through a temporary period and would return home soon. I agreed with their optimistic forecast and waited patiently for her. Unfortunately, my hopes were dashed when I unexpectedly received the divorce papers, from which it became clear that she had been planning this all along, and this was not just a temporary stage. I tried to contact Katie, but she didn't answer. At the same time, my children sincerely tried to convince their mother not to divorce, but she refused to listen to them. A few weeks later, our divorce was finalized, marking the end of our 30-year marriage and leaving me single. The next day, I came across Katie's latest video. And now I'm lying on my new bed, feeling like royalty in what can only be called a princess bed. Yesterday it rained incessantly throughout the entire moving process, but today when I woke up, there were profound changes in me. I felt an overwhelming sense of liberation, as if a heavy burden had been lifted from me. And for the first time in many years, I felt genuine excitement coursing through my veins. It's still a mess, because I haven't unpacked everything yet, and the apartment itself is quite small, so I'll have to organize everything properly. Nevertheless, I am very grateful for these changes. It's been a few weeks of non-stop moving, but now I've finally settled into my new apartment. I'll give you a little tour of it tomorrow. In the meantime, I just want to say hello. Right now, I'm being treated to a delicious dinner prepared by my incredibly attractive boyfriend. Life couldn't be better. In the past, I've experienced anger and heartache because someone not only destroyed my house, but also broke my heart. My children witnessed this unfortunate incident and reached out to me to comfort and encourage me to move on. Eventually, I managed to do this, and I met a wonderful woman named Maya, 
who was about 40 years old and worked as a single teacher in high school. After we immediately found a common language, our relationship remained strong. I did not consider it necessary to inform my ex-wife about this, because I did not attach any importance to it. But striving for harmony and familiarity, I organized a trip for my children and Maya. To my surprise, Maya offered to invite my ex-wife Katie, believing that it was extremely important for her to acknowledge my current relationship. Reluctantly, I contacted Katie and gave her the invitation, but she initially refused to join us. At that time, I hadn't informed her about Maya yet, but later my daughter contacted her, inviting her to join us and making it clear that the invitation would not be repeated. I organized a great boat trip for everyone, and Katie became the latest addition to our group. She arrived unaccompanied, and I took the opportunity to introduce her to Maya, expressing my sincere happiness at our relationship. In that fleeting moment, I wished I could take a picture of Katie's expression. She had a flushed face, clearly taken aback by the fact that I had found happiness. During the trip, I enjoyed the way Katie expressed her disapproval of Maya and me. Despite Maya's good intentions, I was delighted with the result. A few days later, another video of Katie surfaced. The last few days have been incredibly hard for me, and although I realize that it's not entirely my fault, I can't help but blame myself. Deep down, I knew that discovering my estranged husband's new romantic relationship would trigger a strong physical and emotional reaction in me. Despite the year-long separation, we got together from time to time as a married couple, and he constantly assured me that he had no affection. But, as fate has shown, it turned out to be a lie. I've been thinking for a long time about whether traveling was a wise decision on my part. Despite my initial hesitation, I eventually decided to take part in an event that my ex-husband invited me to. My daughter was instrumental in convincing me, as she thought this might be my last opportunity. Looking back, I now understand her concern. What really upset me was not the fact of a new relationship with my ex-husband. I have a boyfriend myself, but the fact that he did not tell me about it. It made me question the security I once felt in his presence, believing that he still cared about me. He invited me to go on a trip with him and our daughters, to which I agreed without hesitation. Unfortunately, it was during this trip that I came across horrifying texts that completely horrified me. The subsequent events were nothing more than a severe trauma that led to a physical and emotional breakdown. It seemed to me that my emotions were out of control, and I fell into despair. Coping with this terrible ordeal has proved to be a constant challenge for me. Her suffering was not caused by the fact that she had lost me, but rather by the fact that she had lost privileged access to my resources and the stability that I provided. A special catalyst was that she found out that I was confessing my love to another woman, which indicates a deeper connection that goes beyond simple romantic involvement. Unlike Katie's partner, who usually started casual relationships without significant emotional or financial investments, a person like me, falling in love, becomes completely devoted. He often wants to create a future with a woman who is deeply dear to him, but for Katie, the real trouble was that another woman had replaced her in my life. My phone started buzzing with countless calls from Katie, full of regret and constant reminders that I had once asked her to come back. In response, I firmly stated that it was too late now and she would no longer have a place in my life. The opportunity is missed because she has already made a decision. She had shaped her own reality, and now she had to face the consequences of her choice. Soon after, another video featuring Katie appeared. In it, she expressed dissatisfaction with her current position. Memories of happy times haunted her, making her wonder if it was her fault. Perhaps she was selfish or narcissistic. The burden of maintaining appearances and pretending everything was okay weighed heavily on her. I think I was in a state of shock before, but now I'm starting to realize the reality of the situation. Although I understand that this is just a separation, and there are more serious challenges in the world, I can't help but feel insecure about what lies ahead. My memories are mostly filled with happy moments, 
so it's hard for me to remember any negative events. I fondly remember a wonderful woman who was once my close friend. To my surprise, they invited me to have dinner with them tonight, and I went to buy gifts for her children. She longed for liberation, and now she has it completely. With a newfound personal life and the opportunity to go out on her own, she finally found the desired freedom. My daughter, although she agreed with every word I said, could not help but empathize with her mother's deplorable decisions. A few days later, another video appeared, starting with a cheerful greeting. From time to time, she thinks about what is behind her actions and what reasons she is guided by when choosing. Last night, she had a dream that featured her rejected husband. In a dream, he came up to me with tears in his eyes and told me about the severity of the arm injury. A strong desire to help him overwhelmed me, and I suggested the idea of moving closer to provide care and support. It seemed that we were starting all over again, remembering the old days. This dream was disturbing, especially considering its implausibility. But I guess that's the nature of dreams. They can evoke emotions that my body interprets as lingering attachment to him. I will always support him, that's for sure. But circumstances have changed, and my feelings have become more complicated. From time to time, I get frustrated, and I start to wonder why he doesn't recognize my rightful share. Although he intends to provide me with some financial support, it does not match what I think I deserve. In the end, our successes were achieved through joint efforts. My parents contributed by lending us money, and I played a significant role in supporting and encouraging him throughout our journey. Despite numerous difficulties and mistakes, I always took responsibility for my actions, especially when I decided to break up. It seems that his actions were often overlooked, and mine were constantly considered guilty. As a result, I am at a precarious stage of my life, experiencing financial difficulties and solving the difficult task of finding suitable housing. Many people, especially men, consider women unworthy, often classifying them as freeloaders who should rely only on themselves. Because of these preconceived beliefs, I feel undervalued and devoid of self-esteem after devoting 30 years of my life to caring for someone. It's extremely difficult. After watching the video, I couldn't help but doubt that she had lost her mind. It is important to recognize that she received her share of the fortune in the divorce. I followed all the rules and acted within the law. It is unfair for her to manipulate me and portray me as an antagonist in this situation, as well as to shift the blame on me for her own wrong decisions. At first, I had a desire to take revenge and sue her because of the video she shared. But Maya intervened and advised me not to pay attention to her actions. In response, my children turned to Katie, urging her to apologize for her post. Otherwise, she faces exclusion from the lives of all people. Katie, with limited options, reluctantly shared a meager apology, attributing her mental health problems as the reason. Shortly after that, I got married to Maya and decided to unsubscribe from Katie on all my social networks.